We are in Deuteronomy chapter 4. We are um, picking up there in verse 15. That's where we had um, ended. And, um, and we see there Deuteronomy 4 verse 15 where the, it's titled in my Bible, Beware of Idolatry. And uh, I entitled the message, Beware of Idols. And it says there, Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you out at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And so the Lord um, warns them and it's interesting um, because it... Um, it's the idea of worshiping anything that man has made to represent, you know, anything that we would be surrounded by that can become an idol. When you think about that, anything can become an idol. Um, little God, little G. And, um, and there's a warning and it says there that even when the Lord spoke to the people, it was without, you know, a f out without form. You know, he didn't even give them a view of himself because, and then they would right away make a, an idol and uh, like that. And so, um, you know, people will often say, well, show me. Show me God and I'll believe, you know. Uh, you know, where is he? Where's he at? You ever have somebody do that to you? It's like, well, God is invisible, but look around. Look around and tell me you can't see in just the wonders of what he has created that, you know, God is, you know, uh, everywhere as we are given insight to that and understanding of that. But, um, but, you know, it gets to where people, they begin to build their lives around things that are just like a card house is the way I look at it, you know, um, and it could just all crumble down or, you know, just, just it has no substance to it. I, I remember one pastor calling it, you know, tinsel, tinsel town. It's all tinsel town, and but yet the true substance is in the living God, and yet you know the enemy he paints a picture that isn't real. You know the cards may have dollar signs on them or whatever. Um, it's all a facade, like a movie set in Hollywood, you know. And the devil loves to put out false expectations and um, to get people to believe in things like that. And I, you know, people miss out on what's real. Um, the Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 uh, Corinthians 10, where he says, um, see, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, speaking of those spiritual battles, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So the strongholds are real. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So constantly who God is is being assaulted by this deception, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is Fulfilled. So you notice there, your obedience is the determining factor and the way things turn out. And so you're going to be bombarded. 
That's absolutely going to happen. The enemy is going to come against you, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. And so, you know, you have um, in those verses things that are man-made. Be on guard against idol worship. And the more technical things become, you know, they have... They have commercials, you know, with the different vehicles that are coming out, you know, and they, they have a person just walking down the street and then a certain vehicle comes by and it's a head turner to everybody, you know, and, and that's how they're, that's the sell, selling pitch. This is a head turner. And, you know, it's true. We can be so impressed by what man makes, but we are to worship God and him alone. And so we're commanded in scripture in Exodus 20, verse 1 through 6, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You know, the, the world, Egypt, is always sim symbolic of the world. And he's rescued them from that bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Notice little, little g there. Those are idols. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, so you notice the emphasis on the hate continues, that sin continues and is contagious. And so then, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so once again, to hate God is contagious in a family or a group. And to love God is also contagious and spontaneous in, in the blessing. To, to follow, and I think, wow, you know, that's so true. As you love God, you can't help but receive his blessings, and even your family can be blessed as you continue to love God. You can pray. You can pray for them, and prayer is powerful. Why? Because God, you know, you have that relationship with God. But notice in just that passage, it says, you shall not make for yourself. Notice the command is singular. And so... You know, we can't ride the shirt tails of another's obedience. Obedience is for each one of us. And God, the one that knows very much so who's following him. And so if, uh, if we're not on guard, we can get caught up. You know, let's call it overly impressed with things and people. And the things and people that we're overly impressed with can really end up being step, stepping stones to full-blown worship of those things or idolatry. And we have to stay on track, take a step back. Anything that's man-made like technology or new philosophies, they're always knocking on our hearts to try and capture us. But the Lord warns against that idolatry. And so man, we must admit, they have invented amazing things. I mean, it's easily to see that. Nobody's denying that. But anything that man has created, it pales into compar comparison to God's creation and the glory of God and the majesty of God and the presence of God. Anything that man has done, they've used something God already made and then they've, you know, built upon that. But God created from nothing. And so we worship God who spoke into existence these things. And so, you know, as long as we stay on that track, we're not going to get caught off guard. And, um, and so, with God, things are eternal. With God, those things are freely given to us who worship him 
And it tells us that in Isaiah, I love Isaiah 55, that says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come by and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of of David. And so the everlasting covenant speaks of salvation and where it says and let your soul delight itself meaning it's conditional. It's it's really allowing be in that place to allow God to bless you like he wants to bless you. And so um you know God's heart, you know we see in the person of Jesus Christ, right? Over and again, Jesus, uh, you know, said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, very familiar passage where he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so take, it's made available, the rest we have in the Lord and worshiping and serving him. And so you see that in those first three verses, no form was given. And, um, and they were to stick with the word of God. That's what jumped out at me. It wasn't an image, it was the word of God that was given to them. And uh, not what they could imagine or perceive to be true, but was, was true. And um, not an idol, but the living promises of God, the living word. And um, any form that we could attempt to come up with would never measure up and become a deception. I always think of that, have you ever seen that movie, um, the Christmas Story. Um, it's a popular movie, where the guy, he uh, he wins a a a special award. You remember, and he has this big crate come to his house, and he gets inside, and he's pulling all the wrappings out, and it ends up being a woman's leg shaped like a woman's leg, and it's a lamp. You remember that? And he puts it in the front window and plugs it in and. <laughs> gets out just to everybody see his special award. I think that's an idol. And that's how foolish I think it can be when you look at it from a humorous standpoint. you know. But to, to focus on the living God, and if you see in verse 19, you see there not to worship what God made either, which would be, of course, creation, like the stars and the sun and so forth. He says there, uh, and take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. So you don't worship anything man can make, but you also don't worship anything God has made. You worship God. See, that's the idea. And people over, you know, man's history, they worship the sun, they worship the moon, they worship the stars, the age of Aquarius, and all that, you know, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, which, which, which my birthday falls into their dates, uh, so I'm an Aquarius. And I know nothing ever dawned on me, you know, uh, <laughs> you know the age of Aquarius. But, but that's what people do, right? They... They worship all these different things, and Romans is very clear regarding that, <clears throat> where in Romans it tells us that we are not to worship the, crea the creation, but we are to worship the creator. And um, I didn't 
I didn't write that down. Oh, there it is. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, to think otherwise is just rebellion, because although they knew God, they can say what they want, but they knew God, and they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, you know, the one that showed no image or form, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature or the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So you see, it doesn't really matter what a person might worship, but we are to worship God alone. Now, did Jesus receive worship? He did. Countless times. Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus is God. He never corrected them when they, they came t to worship him after, you know, he revealed the miracles and so forth. There's one, one account in Matthew 14, 33. Um, uh, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And never did Jesus discourage worship. You know, uh, never did he correct them who came to worship him, being the living God. And so, you know, um, but the warning is against those who would be all caught up with idols, what are idols? You know, in the scriptures, it tells us idols can't see, idols can't hear, idols can't speak. You know, I, th I was thinking of uh, the passages um, um, in First Samuel, remember when the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it into the house of Dagon, which was their idol, and they said, they said, they set the ark there before Dagon, and when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in, back in his place again, their, their God. And when they arose early in the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its head were broken off on the threshold, only Dagon's torso was left of it. So what was their response? When the men of, of Ashdod saw how it was, they said the ark of the ark of the God of Israel must not re, not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. Imagine that. Their little idol set on a shelf, kept falling over and then broken pieces and they couldn't do that. So they said, Well let's get rid of the ark of God, which represented the presence of God, and, and uh, so we could keep our little God safe on the shelf. And uh, that's pretty pathetic. But that's what idol worshipers do. Um, in Leviticus 26.1, you shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. This is emphasized. And then in the New Testament, Paul writes, therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, he says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. We know an idol is nothing. You know, it's, it's a lifeless thing. Uh, Psalms 115, 1 through 9 not, un, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so, there is their, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver 
and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. I mean, that couldn't be any more, you know, obvious of what people that are pursuing uh, something or someone other than God are not hearing except for idle talk and whatever it is that, you know, would would please would please them and and it's and it's sad but it's the heavens the bible says declare the glory of god and the firmament shows his handiwork and so as we look we see god's handiwork you can't help but see it and if you look into the science and the biology it is so impossible impossible to their theory of evolution to ever happen by chance that it cries out for a creator, everything does. Mm -hmm. And you know, to us it seems obvious, right? If you're a believer. Now, to show you how deep de deception goes, um, what we were talking about earlier in California. To us it's obviously, you're talking about to legitimize murder to kill an infant baby. Now, as ob that's obvious to all of us, but somehow or another, they're trying to enact that into law. So apparently, that same deception that keeps them from seeing what they're doing there is the same deception that keeps them from seeing the living God. And so unless eyes are opened, you're talking to blind people. And so, you know... <clears throat> It takes uh, the, the moving of the Holy Spirit to open up blind eyes. And uh, so <clears throat> you don't worship what man makes. You don't worship what God makes. You worship him alone. And then in verse uh, 20 there, we see that we are a privileged, purposed people commissioned by the Lord, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. So we know that, um, that, that, that principle of God blessing his people then um, carries through to his church today. You know, we see that uh, in a couple of places. I wrote down Titus 2, 11 through 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. And so we are God's special people delivered supernaturally by God himself through the work of Jesus Christ. And then Peter says it this way, chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, for you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the things that we see and understand are because he has called us into the light. And so he has given us light. The people that think, like we talked about earlier in California, the people that worship the creation and not the creator, those people are in darkness still. And um, that helps us to understand. It doesn't make it any better, but it certainly gives us understanding. 
And then from verse 21 through 24, we see Moses, uh, I think we see him expressing his humanness here. Um, and also, I think it reminds us of the importance of just being uh, content with all that the Lord does in our lives. In verse 21, furthermore, the Lord has was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I would not cross over the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not cross over the Jordan, but you shall cross over and possess that good land. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a carved and, <laughs> and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. So be careful that you don't do the very thing that God's forbidden you to do. But Moses, uh, he says, I must die. So we know that Moses is going to a better place, um, but he had a desire on earth. And what was that? He wanted to go into the promised land. So the desire on earth was unfulfilled, um, but that's also a common tale. And I would only say that with that in mind, Moses was human. So Moses was going to struggle with very much the same things that we would struggle with. He tried to talk to God a couple times about going in. Finally, God says, I've had enough of this. Don't ask me again about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we see Moses' humanness, which is encourages me. That's like I always go, my go-to is Peter in the New Testament, mm -hmm. that his humanness was obvious and, and his frailty and his lack of faith and everything else. Even Paul had to, you know, lock his heels and rebuke him. And so, I, so he's, he's a go-to for me, an encouragement. But I think what I pick up from this and I was reminded of was uh, being content. The key is going or not going, having or not having, doing or not doing to be content. Because God's the one calling it out. And that's why the New Testament tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain and so it's the idea of um that word gain i don't know if you've ever thought about that it's great gain the word gain comes from a word meaning to furnish an acquisition in other words an asset or an object obtained and so the idea is um that by being content, we're blessed with spiritual resources and advantages. In other words, being content is a gift that keeps giving. So it's great gain. You take away that contentment, and you can long for something that really ends up being a false expectation. You pray about it, and you go where God leads you to go. You do what God gives you to do, and you, know, you have what God lets you have. And you rest in that. Because if you're always striving to get something that maybe is never on the list of things to get, then you're going to be less than satisfied in that place of where the Lord has you. And so you'd miss out on that. And, you know, I think all of us are going to struggle to a point with that because we're all human. But it's good to know so you can pull up from nose dives, you know. You dive and you can pull out. You dive and you pull out. <laughs> Um, especially when, you know, we're, we're so, uh, you know, sent that message of what's popular in the world or, or not popular. Now, uh, from verse 25 to verse 31 there, you see uh, that God gives them the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And of course, we know that. But God's word gives it to you straight. And that's why you'll, you'll get all the dirt, if you will, on all the prophets and 
all those esteemed highly through the scriptures. What, what does the Bible also reveal to us? The dirt. Why? Because it isn't man who has written it. It's God. And what would it be if that was all hidden from our view? We would think like somehow I've got to attain to a higher place to be like these that have attained to great places of faith. No, they had battles. And so God, you know, here uh, is just going to show them, first of all, that things that would happen, they really would probably argue with him at this point and say that these things wouldn't happen. But it's a reminder that God's previous to every situation. And, uh, and the Bible does tell us that, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, but God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if you look there, um, at verse, starting with verse 25, when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly, and make a carved image in the form of anything, and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. So, the, so this is a prophecy. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord, your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord, your God, and obey his voice, for the Lord, your God, is merciful, a merciful God, he will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. Wow. So he's saying, don't go into the land and become idol worshipers. And then after the command went forth, he says, but you're going, after you have your kids and after you have your grandkids, so in generations moving forward, you're going to become idol worshipers. And you're going to be scattered, which they were throughout the whole earth. It's just in these latter days that they're starting to flood back into Israel. And Israel now has become a nation. So you see that this is what took place with them. God's telling it to them straight. But it was after their conquest of their promise, the promised land. And at that time where it says... That, you know, verse 26, that you will soon utterly perish. So they have a conquest, and then they're really in a vulnerable place. Desperate times are often the most safe times. That's when people all of a sudden pray. I'm in a desperate situation. We, can, we should relate to this. Prosperous times, which... I think are coming to an end. <laughs> um, you know, we're in a safe place. You know, we've got our bills are paid and we've got food in the refrigerator and we're doing fun things and we're not sweating bullets and all of that. And you could tend to all of a sudden forget to, you know, we're desperate in this dying world to be completely following the Lord. In Galatians, uh, it tells us not to grow weary in well-doing, where it says, Galatians chapter 6, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not 
be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so, you know, we have um, a prophecy here given. And remember now, um, Moses is giving them a history lesson once again, but now here is a history lesson speaking uh, also prophetically. And we had seen sad uh, through church history where, you know, there was... Uh, a, a distancing from the Lord. Like if you read Revelations chapters 2 and 3, of the seven churches, there's only two that there's no rebuke given. But when you, when you see church history and you line up um, the various churches, you'll see that there was a distancing even of the church because the church, when it was prospering, would be distanced from the Lord, but the church, when it was through persecution, would draw close to the Lord. And so, you know, we see that trend in, in people, generally speaking. And in verse 28 there, it says, And there you will serve gods, that the work of men's hands. And so, um, in other words, instead of serving the living God, they would be serving the lifeless idols. Instead of having new life, they would be trusting in the work of men's hands and and, and rather than trusting, you know, the work of, of God in our lives is trust, trusting man. And that always ends up empty, <coughs> hopeless, you know, and having no insight or foresight, not hearing from God, unable to taste and see the good things of the Lord. Like Psalms 34, 8, where it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Missing out on all of that. Why? Because trusting in men. It's real easy in our society of, um, you know, social security and, um, you know, in uh, having uh, retirement programs and having, um, you know, just security and bonds and, you know, all these things. It's real easy to trust in those things. There's nothing wrong with those things. But if we put our trust in those things, we're on thin ice. Because at any time, you know, those things can go away. What does it say in the Proverbs? Money grows wings and flies away. I personally know two of two people that lost their whole retirement. Uh, by One by a bad investment, another by the company going bankrupt and both lost their retirement. Everything that they banked on for retirement, just gone. But what if your security is completely in the living God? How does that get taken from you? You know, it doesn't, and it cannot. And that's why it's important. <clears throat> and so, you know, tasting and see of those good things of the Lord, the insights that come from hearing from the Lord and enjoying His presence. And then... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 29, where it says, But from there you will seek the Lord. Now notice, when they get to that place of desperation, when they do turn to the Lord um, in that place of listening, or hearing nothing from the Lord, serving idols, then they turn to the living God. And if they seek him genuinely, they will find him. And when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, notice in tribulations, then they, uh, it says, turn to the Lord your God and obey him. Then the Lord will be merciful to them. And so they have that promise. Why? Because God is merciful. Now, I've seen and heard and, you know, been in situations where myself, Myself, where I, I've blown it again. 
I've blown it again. I did that again. And if I didn't know the word of God, I couldn't confidently come back and expect the forgiveness of God. Instead, uh, I would uh, maybe adopt the, the theology thinking that I've got to get my life back together before I serve God. And it's the polar opposite of that. Without asking for forgiveness and being right with God, you're never going to have your act together. But no sooner do you come to the Lord and asking forgiveness, then guess what? You're right with the Lord. And then if through his power, you can accomplish those things. And so, But the enemy doesn't want you or I to know that. Now you see in verse 32, um, and I always try to apply this to personal history, you know, how we would relate. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on earth and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened or anything like it has been heard. In other words, what God did for you as a nation is so off the charts, never happened in the history of man Think, ask, look around. Have you ever seen God do this for anybody else? And meanwhile, he's done it for you. He's done it for you. Just look and check it out. And so that's what's being said there. And, you know, how we relate in modern times is that we worship an unchanging God. And the way that he worked for a nation, now he works for the church. And now what he's done for us, we look and we say, Nothing as incredible as this could, nothing better could ever happen to me. We relate. Search the world over and you'll see nothing. You, you could hit 10 lottos and it would be nothing compared to what God has given to you. Matter of fact, if you hit 10 lottos, you'd probably have a heart attack and die, <laughs> you know, and then it would be worthless. But what God has done takes us through eternity into heaven you know, and, uh, and gold is used as pavement in heaven. And so, you know, so once again, the same God that did that for them is doing that for us, has opened blind eyes, and now we see um, in verse 33, you know, once, once in a while I just have to pinch myself for all that God has done. When you read like this, did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? And so, no, the answer is no. God spoke to them out of the fire, and you were privileged to hear his voice. And I'd only say I have to pinch myself because often I hear the voice of the Lord, not audibly, but through his word, he confirms that he's speaking to my heart. And, um, you know, his still small voice. I have been given understanding of the times that we live in because of the Spirit of God. And I have to pinch myself, why do I deserve that? And, you know, and, um, and God's people are being reminded of that in this, this um, sermon, you might say, that's coming to an end here, uh, the end of chapter 4. But... We see a supernatural deliverance. They're reminded of that, verse 34. Or did God ever try, ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials and signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors uh, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And so it's speaking there of divine deliverance. And once again, Egypt speaks of the world and all of us can just connect with that because that's exactly what God has delivered us from. And he works on multiple levels. You notice he says that he used trials and signs and wonders and war and his mighty hand, just direct outstretched arm. And so God worked in many, many ways. And so you know, he has taken us out of darkness and has brought us into the light. Ephesians 5.8, for you were once in darkness in Egypt, 
but now you are in light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, and we are holy. First Peter 2 9. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So that's deliverance. His deliverance is supernatural. And then we see there um, verse 35 and 36 there. Um, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. And so there are no other gods, no false gods. No false gods are the living God out of heaven. He lets you hear his voice that he might instruct you. See that singular personal. On earth he showed you his great fire and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. So that, you know, once again, that personal encounter. Moses here um, is given an example. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in to give you their land as, as an inheritance as it is this day. And so, uh, and so the example of Moses was actually um, back in 36 at the end there where he says his words... Uh, he's given came out of the midst of the fire and if you remember uh, for Moses it was a bush that never burned the the this the talking bush Exodus 3 2 and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush so he looked and behold the bush was burning with fire but the bush was not consumed so that was God's personal uh, encounter with Moses and that encounter would be one that would keep on giving, you know, and I'm sure that, that you have those where the Lord works such a way. Um, verse 39 and 40, uh, we see again, obedience is rewarded. Uh, therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other you shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. And so always remember that even though they're going to be scattered, there's always a remnant in the land that stayed there, and there's always those that were obedient to the Lord. Uh, besides, there was always those who would go and do their own thing that God would deal with. And, um, but that you, that, that it may go well with you and your children. And so not only us, but our families would be blessed. And um, I have a quote here from Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> he says, boxing, <laughs> you know, um, the idea life is not something we can take a break from. And then Sylvester Stallone says this, boxing is a great exercise as long as you can yell cut whenever you want. <laughs> I like that. Because, you know, life, you can't just yell cut. But you can cry out to the living God. <laughs> That's much better than that. And um, the battle line is drawn and the weapons are you know, for that frontal fight to stay in it. And, um, and so, and so we don't have time to finish out this chapter, but we'll pick up there. Uh, this next part is dealing with the cities of refuge that, um, that God is going to give uh, the people that place to be able to flee to, um, when needed. And, um, so that'll be interesting. But Lord, uh, we thank you for your word.
uh, to us. And, um, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being faithful and to speak to our hearts from your word that truly is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we ask, God, that, um, that we would have a sensitivity as we're bombarded in a world of technology and a world of wickedness and equally wicked no matter where you go. Um, we know that um, the enemy's at work. And I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to to keep our eyes upon you and cry out to you for wisdom and help us, Lord, to make a difference where we're planted. You've placed us here to make a difference in the lives of those people that we would, um, you know, run into and have conversations with. And uh, Lord, we're called to make disciples. And, and I just pray that we would be faithful to do that here in uh, Central Oregon, Lord, as you give us opportunity. And um, so help us, fill us with your spirit, Lord. Uh, bless us as a church family as well, Lord, to, to be that encouragement, to lift one another's arms up and to pray for one another and to just be there for each other. So we just thank you for the opportunities that you do give us like that. Lord, I just pray a blessing upon your people now that you would uh, strengthen us, uh, that, you would, that you would bless us and our families. And Lord, you know all the concerns represented here. Uh, Lord, you know uh, the things that, uh, the struggles that are going on here. And I just ask uh, for a mighty move of your spirit, Lord, regarding all these details that are going on. And you're the only one that knows hearts, Lord. So we just lift our heart to you. Just ask that you would be glorified in our lives. And we just ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.